Good morning, good morning. We have some people in Zoom and in person, so people on Zoom <clears throat> definitely do not see it, uh, but we have a full room um, over here at the Canton office. <laughs> no, we have two people here, um, but uh, we could probably give it another minute and then jump on. Love to see everybody's faces too, just marks. <laughs> I see a double of you. I've got you in the background and here, which is which is it's good. It's good. You don't want to see me this morning. Why is that? I didn't even brush my hair yet. <laughs> Mark did me there, so. Linda, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, still have wet hair. That's all you get. <laughs> See you, bye. <laughs> That's all right. I had to come to the office today to get ready for some uh, appointments later on. So that's why I'm here. And this this class, of course, plays a part in that. So my wife texted me and she was like, you're out of the house early today. I was like, I have a class. I have a class. <laughs> we can probably get started, though. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, obviously to Mark, uh, Amanda, the rest of the staff are actually letting me host these classes. This is like my third or fourth one I've done. And uh, <clears throat> they have no idea what I'm teaching. So they have an idea of what the topic is, but not actually like the subject matter and and uh you know i appreciate that so um if you're not on camera you may want to be ready to raise your hand because i'm gonna have some questions uh first would be does anybody have any experience working at a different company other than kw uh before they came to kw yes Our yes, I was with Howard Hanna previously. Okay, Linda was too. Okay, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I did too. And this isn't a class that I was asked to do. Uh, you know, it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the benefits of family reunion, uh, bold, KW, KW Maps coaching and some career visioning too, because, uh, well, we'll talk about why in a minute, but um, by a show of hands, uh, has anybody attended at least one of those things? Go through them again. Uh, KW uh, Maps coaching, Bold, Family Reunion, or uh, Career Visioning. Okay, Lillian has. Yes, yeah, Bold. Bold, yeah, okay. <clears throat> bold's obviously the most common one because it's usually local um and for the value that you're able to get from it uh from a cost standpoint um i think at a glance it does seem like the best deal so i'd, I'd imagine bold's probably the one that most of us have been to and it might have been where i've uh you know met so many agents from the cleveland area and things like that but um Anybody been to more than one of them? Family reunion, bold, maps coaching. Probably, I think just me. Just, just Mark. Okay, cool. <clears throat> That's perfect because uh, my goal is to increase your familiarity with these things. And when uh, this class ends, it ends. I want to try to uh, help you achieve your goal uh, by hopefully attending one of these things someday. So. Why Keller Williams? Well, I think that there are two reasons that cause us to be here. I think there's the reason that we came, and then there's the thing that actually keeps us here. Um, and these are the things that keep me here um, and what I get so much value out of. Uh, so Family reunion, go ahead. I, I, I want to interrupt with a question. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you start, they may not be able to hear me. I'm not going to mute myself because that'll create complications. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody can't hear Mark, just let, 
Uh, so Can you tell us that you're going to talk about some things that have made a big difference in your business and what 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 they did and what difference they made? Mm -hmm. But can you give us a snapshot of the you pre all of those things? And if if you don't want to, mm -hmm. I, I can throw you under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, uh, let's do it, Mark. I'd love to hear. Yeah. So you want me to come up there so they? Can... Uh, yeah, probably. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly what Christian's going to talk about today, but I'm excited to hear what he says. Um, when I came into the role September 3rd of 2020, but who's counting, um, Christian had his, his um, cubicle right outside my office. So I, I feel like I had a front row seat um, to that. And what I witnessed was someone who was hungry. He showed up eight o'clock every day. He was always the first one in the office. He was always ready to grind. Um, he showed up hungry in the sense that he was looking to learn. And I think as he gets ready to talk about the things that have made the biggest difference in helping him, because in the previous year, I think you'd done 11 or 13 mm -hmm. deals. You yeah. know, if you were someone who was selling homes and you were showing up, you were what, 19 mm -hmm. at that point? Yeah, yeah very average production. Um, and now your team did how many, how many deals this past year? Uh, it's a little over 50. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what I saw then was the same person that I see today from a, from a drive and I, I want to go and do something, but he needed some, he needed some, um, some guidance, some accountability, some clarity to, to move him, to move him forward. So, um, I think for those that are looking for like a, a pill. <laughs> how do I, how do I do the right thing that helps me quintuple my business? Um, the, I like to say that the three things you can't teach someone is hunger, humility, and emotional intelligence. Like those are, those are classes that are hard to teach. Um, and you may disagree with me on those things, but I like, I'm proud to see the progress that you've made. I'm excited to hear what you have to say, but, uh, I want to say it wasn't like, all of a sudden things change. It was like, no, you were already ready to unafraid to do the really hard work. Mm -hmm. And, and this stuff made the difference. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Appreciate it. Leading up to, you know, the, the point where my business did begin to actually grow. I did have, uh, you know, two years where I just pulled my hair out because I was like, I deserve this more than anybody. Now this was 19 year old me talking. So, but these were my thoughts was like, I've been working hard at this for so long that I should have it by now. I should have it by now. I should have it by now. And, you know, something that has always stuck with me is that the lower the lows you get, especially, I mean, it, it, you have to be working hard and you have to, you have to persevere and you have to have that determination, but um, the lower the lows, the higher the highs. Um, so find myself struggling one year, I can usually uh, see my way through what it could look like in the future. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit of the background of, of me, I guess. Um, so, yeah, let's jump into Family Reunion. So it's a Keller Williams ran event. And the event is held every year in a different city. It starts in about 30 days in Las Vegas. Uh, Nevada, first time going. And Family Reunion has a great, sorry, first time going to Las Vegas, not Family Reunion. Um, Family Reunion has had a really great foundation for me uh, to start building agent to agent relationships and 50 conversations. If, if you can achieve one thing in the three days that you're at Family Reunion in the midst of attending classes and mixers, it's to connect and exchange contact information with 50 agents and add them on Facebook too. Because if you're not the type to call your agent to agent referrals all the time and keep in touch, Facebook is a great way just to see what they're up to, keep in touch um, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, my, my first agent, or sorry, my first year that I went to family reunion, the first agent I met, shout out Aaron Warfield out of Dayton, um, was, uh, 
the gave me a referral. Um, I met her the second I walked into the building. We talked for five or ten minutes. We added each other on Facebook, and she sent me a really, really great uh, buyer referral that funded my own my entire trip about two months after I got home from family reunion. I was like to start with that because there's a lot of value in meeting these agents from out of the country that are out of the state, out of the country. So laser focused intentions uh, caused this to manifest itself as well as proper preparation um, because I came to family reunion with a question that I asked every single person that I met, not only the 50 agents that I met, but the influencers I met, like, um, I think it's, uh, might be Scott Toombs. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Scott Toombs. Um, you know, I was actually trying to name off a lot of the amazing people I met, but it, you've got, you've got, uh, you know, Ben Kenny's team that I met. I've got all these amazing people that I could, uh, name drop. Um, uh, you know, Jeff Glover met him there. Um, but, uh, they, the question that I asked was something that I was trying to learn from and something that I was kind of uh, just trying to expand on. And that question was what fueled me for the rest of the year. Um, in my uh, interactions with my team um, and with anybody I came in touch with. So my, my overall attitude was impacted by, by, by coming to, Family reunion. That was a question. Um, what is the one thing that you should do to uh, make your world big enough so that agents inside of it don't want to leave? Oh. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of a team growth specific mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, organizational growth, leadership growth, mm -hmm. um, sort of thing. Uh, so next thing uh, would be bold. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it is business objective, like by design. That's what you bold, it. Yeah. bold stands for. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of telling you what you need to do and what you're going to learn from the bold, from bold. Your business objective should be to give you your life by design. Um, and I have the bold laws hanging up in my office. Um, does anybody have a favorite bold law that they they like? Without popping them up on the screen, I I'm sure there's some KW agents. What comes to mind for me is that your cells eavesdrop on your thoughts. Your cells eavesdrop on your thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because if we're living in a funky headspace, we're not going to take the action we need in order to grow our worlds. So, mm -hmm. so, so having the right mindset is, is upstream of every quality action that we take. Mm -hmm. So living in victimhood, which so many of us do, ah, the weather's bad, my team lost, uh, rates suck, whatever, whatever negative story we want to like let shape us, believe it or not, shapes the, the way we approach every single day. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a big one for me. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. Um, Gina, you said you wanted to go to Bold this year. I would highly recommend it. Um, it's coming in April. It's coming in April. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bold was great. Bold was always really, really great um, for getting people out of their comfort zones. Um, where where would this take place? Uh, this The next Bold is going to be happening here. It's going to be in... Um, Rexville, in all likelihood, Tammy. So it'll be a bit of a drive for you. Okay, that's okay. <sighs> so uh, you get the life you want by learning how to find and close leads and take listings. And um, that's the business objective. That's how we get life by design. We just get leads and close them and take listings. Um, and that's what Bold teaches you to do. I mean, it's that straightforward. Uh, my first bold was coached during a COVID year and it was all digital. So I do remember the biggest takeaway from that bold was meeting an agent named Emily out of Tennessee, who was the 
fifth agent in her state and she was only two years in and it was all from for sale by owners. Mm-hmm. Um, the fifth most productive agent. Yeah, the fifth most productive agent in her state. And all she did was pick up the phone every morning and call the for sale by owners who put their homes on Zillow. There was no magic lead source that you had to pay money for. Or there was no uh, pay to play type type of thing. It was literally just picking up your phone. And that's my kind of, uh, that that was right down, down my alley. So I took notes from my class verbatim and practiced them consistently. And then my business 5 x from 12 units to 62 units uh, in 12 months. Um, That's crazy. That's so crazy. Well, when you talk about that magic pill, uh, it wasn't just attending the class. You know what I mean? I went and I implemented what I was taught. Um, so it's so crazy how much value you can get just from finding somebody who's where you want to be and spending five or 10 minutes and just letting their DNA be your DNA for a little bit and figure out what you need to do to put yourself in their shoes to have the success that they do. Sorry, I'm like interrupting you all. No, I love it. Uh, You're good. 12 to 62 is seismic. Um, Before you made that jump, before Mm -hmm. you took hold, you were already calling FISBOs and expirants, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Tell me what, like, tell me what changed. You know, when you say I put, I put the, um, put what I learned into action. Mm-hmm. Give us, give us, give us some examples about what, what did you do differently? What did you do more of in order to five X in that one year? Yeah. So my first listing I ever took was a for sale by owner. Um, my first, or out of the, that year that I did 12 units, six to eight of them were for sale by owners. Um, Really what changed for me was that uh, focused scripting dialogues uh, and finding a person who was as committed as I am to learning the scripts um, was the biggest thing. So I did a couple of things that made what I was saying to the for sale by owners different. And firstly, it would have been uh, script practicing with my partner for 30 minutes every day going through the entire script both of us but when I really started to notice a difference get this because I'm sure there's people out there who script practice but when I really started noticing a difference was when on my lunch break at the office instead of being on my phone I read through the scripts while I was eating like it was something that took so little discipline to start doing and when I saw that I noticed that all of a sudden Out of the 100 agents who were in uh, or who call for sale by owners in our market, I was the only one who was scrapped practicing twice a day. Mm -hmm. It it, it had to be because it was all of a sudden I was taking every listing from every for sale by owner who wanted to list. Of course, there's going to be ones who never list and there's going to be some who do discount brokers and and, and that sort of thing. But um, it was that little bit of extra work that got me to where I was actually seeing such a big response from it. Um, But before it was just calling and it was building rapport with people, um, building a relationship and having candid conversations about what honestly can happen if you have your house for sale by owner. It wasn't a uh, mofer, you know, I wasn't giving them an offer that would make them go, wow, I want to do that. Um, It was maybe trying to push them in that direction or, you know, make it more feasible, but there wasn't any, there wasn't any real structure. Um, So, uh, yeah. Um, So I think it's an opportunity to tell you guys about a phrase I love to use called R and D and it's research and development. It's typically what it's called, but it literally means rip and rip off. rip off. Yeah, it literally means rip off. And it's such a great thing in this industry to uh, rip off in the right ways. Now, the right way is say is not copying verbatim. Um, it's making it your own, but taking what somebody else does and uh, modeling it um, 
and doing it. And so when it came to the for sale by owner scripts that I was learning off Emily, uh, I adopted her determination, her discipline, and focused uh, to have what they managed to get for themselves. Um, let me check the comments here. Right, it's just you. Yeah, Gina, we can get we can we can chat anytime. I'm here all day. I'm here all day every day. Uh except the weekends. Um so uh I did end up hiring a maps coach uh, about a year and a half ago, which is available to all KW agents. Um if you're producing, so it's it's available to all KW agents. And then if you're a top producer, there's a certain type of coaching called mastery coaching, where you get access to a lot of the different events that KW holds for free. Um, so the amazing thing about Keller Williams Maps Coaching is that it's a network of agents who are all high producers, um, so very similar to yeah. yourself. Uh, who are also going to be under a coach. And in this case, they were under the same coach that I was under. And so we had this community um, because the coach would connect us. But when I stopped doing for sale by owners, uh, there was a new model that I was able to begin doing, uh, which led my business to another breakthrough. Um, and we're in the midst of this transition. Uh, however, I do see it as a breakthrough of a 5X type thing where you go from, you know, 50 units to, uh, what, 250 units. Um, we're kind of in the midst of that transition right now, but the powerful thing that was allowing me to do these breakthroughs all throughout my career was Keller Williams. It was the only real constant and the things that have been provided to us um, put me in a position where when I felt like there was nothing else I could do to be successful, um, when I felt like I should quit because I'm done calling for sale by owners, uh, there was another thing for me. Um, and being in MAPS coaching allowed me to find that next thing. And it was like the magic pill. Um, <laughs> per se. You know, it was that thing that I could do that got me the same results that calling for sale by owners did. Uh, and there's so many of them out there. You you just have to have the network and you just have to have the people around you who are going to uh, be searching for these answers just like you. So, you know, I've met lifelong friends at Keller Williams, uh, from out of the state um, at family reunion or with my maps coach to in state with bold. Uh, and, you know, I could even throw another one in there and say KWYP. Keller Williams has all these amazing little sub communities that you can join and be a part of. And they're usually geographic. So I've joined KWYP and I've met all these top agents in K KW at different offices uh, up in the Cleveland area for referrals, um, you know, out west in Lorraine and Sandusky counties, uh, you know, so so they're friends. Uh, they hold me accountable. And they're familiar to me, of course, and um, they're there for me when I'm looking for solutions. So I only hope that you guys can use these resources uh, the same way I did. Um, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions, discussions, uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, some other things if you guys are wanting to, too. Christian, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So you said that you've been practicing scripting, doing FISBOs. What other ones were you trying to master? Were you just kind of going in rotation or were you just honing in on at that point in time, just FISBOs alone? Just for sale by owners. Gotcha. Um, at that time, I was also, uh, well, uh, at that time, I was also familiarizing myself with the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book. So I was also doing uh, 33 Touch, um, you know, just building out my 
yearly touch plan for my database. Um, but as far as outbound lead generation, I wasn't doing anything else other than for sale by owners. Well, I, uh, you mentioned earlier career visioning. Talk with us uh, a little bit about what that is. Mm -hmm. what that means for you. I really enjoy meeting agents who just came here um, because they don't have any idea what a lot of these resources are. And Nick Rock is a really great example. He was trying to hire somebody and I told him about career visioning and I could imagine he probably took off with it because he's got somebody hired now and uh, it's a really, really solid hire. But uh, career visioning is for people who are looking to uh, grow their businesses, um, whether that's admin help, agent help, whatever it is, really to boil it down, it's a couple day course that you take that brings you through phases of the hiring process. You've got your, uh, you know, preparing stage um, where you actually figure out who it is that you want to hire or your, uh, uh, like your missing person search. Um, and then you've got the interview process, which would be career visioning. Um, and that's going to be doing things like, what is it? Seven step process that the KPA has. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's, there's six or seven steps that are with the KPA and just teaching you how to do that. Um, and then there's uh, the last phase, which is the first 90 days higher, and that's the 30, 60, 90 part. Um, and that is basically your duties that you set out for your hire to do. But not only that, but what goals do they have to hit for you to ensure that you made the right hire? Because you can know within 90 days that you made the right hire. Um Yeah, I think that's probably a decent summary. Anybody has any further interest in learning about career visioning? Uh, let's do it um, in person or right here. I mean, I just don't uh, want to talk about it too much if there's not a need for it with the people that are in this class right now. Christian, I want to ask. So, um... And Carly, can you hear me okay? I know that I'm not on mute, but I don't want to confuse you with it sound. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can just unmute yourself, Mark. Okay. Um, so you need to turn your volume on. Okay. Um, Christian, I think one of the things that struck me about your growth is the the level to which you hold yourself accountable. Um, I think there's a lot of people in this business who they get in because they think it's easy or it's just fun. And I think the way that I've seen you grow is because like, again, you were the, always the first person in the office, not just on Monday mornings, but every day. And one uh, stealing a quote from um, Gina Ferrer, a productivity coach, uh, she'll say a lot of people have full-time goals with, with part-time work ethics, um, you know, Oh, I'm a, I'm a full time agent, and and in reality, if you're really looking at your calendar, it's like, oh, I, in reality, I spend twelve hours a week on real estate related business, and only one hour a week on dollar productive real estate related business, which those are two very different things. And and so, say someone is is here or here and is saying like, shoot, I'm that person. I'm the one who's like saying that I'm trying to grow, but in reality, I'm not actually getting after it to the level that I could. I want to press reset, but I don't frankly know how I would spill, I would fill 40 or 50 hours a week um, because I haven't been doing it for the time that I've been licensed. I've been, I go to a class here or there, I post a thing or two on Facebook and and hope hope the rest happens. Like how would you, how would you coach them to like press reset and then fill their time? Like what would you, what would you load up their their calendar with to help them kind of press reset and, and, and grow their business. I'm going to mute switch. <laughs> um, I guess the framework for why you're doing what you're doing is, is going to be really, really important. Um, 
I can definitely say that everybody's in different points of their lives. Um, but whenever I was starting out, I had this mentality that the hard to, it's like, pick your heart. Um, do you want to be suffering for five years, trying to build a good business, doing the things you're supposed to be so that you can have a career worth of uh, success? Or do you want to struggle because you don't have any money for 30 years? Um, like pick your heart. So, uh, you know, I could do, I could work 25% harder than everybody else for five years. Um, or I could work the same amount of hard and suffering as everybody or not everybody, but what a lot of people might do for their entire careers, just trying to, um, I guess, stay afloat maybe is the. But if you've made that mindset switch, I'm really, I'm willing to, to do the hard work. What now? Yeah. Um, so. It is a question of how are you going to close leads and how are you going to take listings? Um, and how quickly do you need to do it? Um, <laughs> I think everybody should adopt the mindset that you have to you have to get a house under contract in the next week. Where would you go to find it? How would you find it? That's a coach that's a question my coach asks me um periodically and it's really the question all things like if you had to find a house if you had to sell a house could you do it like sam if you had to sell a house in the next week how i mean where would you go to find it could you do it if you had to could you do it if it meant you had to keep your business open where would you go um i'm i'm not sure so i was actually just taking notes to um kind of try and figure out what to ask. I'm having a hard time right now, like balancing things and figuring out, like, I know I want to be successful and how do I want to make myself successful? Cause this has been my first year that I've had a lot going on and I've and had, you're killing it by the way. Thank you. I have three listings on the market right now and they're starting to get more traction. So that's really exciting. Um, but you know, trying to get them under contract, trying to find buyers for these specific listings because they're a little different. I feel like it's going to take that one right buyer. So how do I market that and try to bring more people in? Um, and then my other question is, you know, I need to start time blocking. I Like I have all these ideas, but I just don't know how to organize everything. So like Mark was saying earlier, how do you hit the refresh button and start over? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I do think that there's a tailored answer to a couple of the different things you said. I'm not sure if there's an actual like one, one thing, but uh, just to answer, I guess, my question, um, my coach, if she had to sell a house in the next week, she'd list her own house for sale, get it sold. Um, there's ways to do it. If you have the determination to do it, you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, so it's just a matter of how much you want it. Let's, let's rip on that here. Twitch. Mm -hmm. So let's riff on that for a second. My coach, um, challenged me last week. So there's, there's, um, if we think about leads in a, in a matrix and I don't have a screen to put in front of you, but, there's two types of people in the world in one, in one sense, people, you know, and people you don't know, right. Uh, most of us prefer to relate and spend time connecting with people that we know. Um, but there's a whole world of people that we don't know. That's one, that's one like category. Another category is uh, people who want to do real estate, who are motivated to do real estate business right now, right, Christian. And then there's people who will at some point in the future. And I think, if we put that in a grid, so a, a four by four grid, no, don't know, motivated, not motivated. I think many of us um, prefer to do kind of our day-to-day -day activities are with people that we know who are not motivated to do real estate business. Hey, I connected with a friend and saying top of mind and, and sent them a, you know, a, a holiday greeting and 
lots of long-term nurture stuff, which is important to do. Like the, I, I give you the grid not to say do this and don't do that. Um, but I think a lot of us hang out in the known people, unmotivated real estate quadrant, which is good for maybe a year, maybe three years, maybe five years. You know, we pay, we know people look, you know, they, they move and sell every seven to 10 years on average. So that's like, that's good, you know, people. Um, but I think part of your magic Christian, and that's a mindset shift is no, I'm going to hang out in the motivated unknown quadrant, like the exact opposite quadrant. These are people that I don't know. It's not the, Hey, high school friend, how's it going? And you do some of that. Um, but it's, it's, it's finding the motivated. And I think to steal a Jeff Gloverism, um, the higher the rejection, the activity, the closer we are to money. But most of us, you know, ooh, you know, the the rejection based activity is scary. You know, when I when I'm catching up with a friend, hey, let's get coffee and see how things are going. That's the lowest possible rejection activity, unless you're saying sell your house today or else we're no longer friends. <laughs> you know, unless you're holding them to the fire in a way that I wouldn't want you to do. You shouldn't do that with your with your friends. Um, I think part of your success, Christian, is in sucking it up into your, your language, choosing your hard to say, Hey, the hard of what I'm doing is not just an hours thing, but it's a engaging with more people who are going to say no to me today. Whereas if I reach out to five friends and say, give them a soft, like, Hey, I'd love to get coffee over the course of the next three months with you. Can we find a time? Like five out of five are probably going to say yes. Mm -hmm. But if I call five Fizbos, five out of five might say no to even an appointment. Um, and part of your, part of your magic is not just you're working more hours because you're, you're work, you've worked hard, but you're not working a hundred hours a week. Um, you have, you had a baby and yeah, yeah. You're running more of a business than you used to. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a mentality that says I'm going to be braver than most of my peers and move towards the motivated unknown people. Um, which I think that's that's part of that's part of the shift. So those are those are op city leads. It's fizzbos. That's expireds. That's um, that's circle prospecting in a sense. Like it's the it's the more aggressive stuff. So end scene. I'm meeting myself. Scene. Yeah, um, I totally agree. I just had a thought that a true professional is going to spend time with people or I'm sorry, a true professional is going to provide value to people in all four quadrants. Mm. Um, but, uh, uh, but a true professional is also going to spend most of his time with the people that are in the unknown serious quadrant. Um, you should always be providing value because it's almost like a, it's almost like it cycles, right? I mean, the people who uh, you don't know, who aren't motivated, switch into people who you know, uh, who uh, aren't motivated, and then they switch into people who you know and are motivated. Um, yeah, you need to be prepared to provide value and nurture a relationship in all four quadrants, right? All, all the time, right? And that's that's how you go from fifty to two fifty, because you can right. go from twelve to fifty two or sixty two. Um, by grit and sharpening your sword, which is what you did. Mm -hmm. But you don't go from 50 to 250 the same way you went from 12 to 62. No. Uh, you have to you have to build more of a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, d I did have a slower year this year. Obviously, I had baby and stuff like that. But the way that I look at it is like, with my business, is it's like a slingshot. Like, I have four years where I'm just kind of stagnant, and then I have a explosion and then I'll have another two, three, four years where I'm kind of stagnant and then I'll have another five X explosion. That's the way that uh, you know, um if that's the way that this is supposed to be for me, then I'm on the journey. Most people don't sign up for real estate because they don't like the inconsistency. We are all here. So the inconsistency doesn't scare us. Um but uh to jump back to some Sam's question, um just about uh, listings and stressing about getting your listings sold. Um, you know, I stress about this too. Um, it's something that, you know, can be frustrating um, when your listings don't sell. And I feel like we put too much pressure on ourselves 
uh, blaming ourselves sometimes um, for listings not selling. And uh, sometimes it is our fault. So I want to help you identify when that is. Um, if you take great pictures, if you have a great description, and if you're marketing your properties in the right places, Facebook ads, you put the proper signage at the property, directionals, uh, Facebook marketplace. I mean, that's that's like 95% of it, you know? Um, but the thing that causes agents not to sell listings is not knowing their seller's drivers for what they're doing and then being afraid to having the pricing conversation. Um, if you're, if you have a seller who's been on the market for two months and they haven't done a price reduction and you're not willing to have that pricing conversation with them once a week, every single week until they do a price reduction, well, then, uh, you know, you may, you may, I mean, that's sometimes that's the level of dedication it takes, but you should never stress yourself out about not selling a listing. You can you can always work that seller harder to do an adjustment if you think that is because if it's because there's the the triangle right of and not to get too off topic, but I do think it's beneficial. There's that triangle where I tell my clients you can only have two out of the three things. You can have price, location, or condition. You can't have all three. So if the house has great condition and it's a great price, the location's probably not going to be great and vice versa. So it's a simple question to the seller where it's like, look, Mr. Seller, we can't change the location of your house. There's a house that sold down the street for 20000 for your price, but they have a new kitchen. So would you like to put in a new kitchen or would you like to lower the price by $20,000? It's your pick. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea. I kind of have. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm muted. That's why. Can you say that again, Sam? Yeah, I was just saying that was a really good idea and kind of a good way to go about it. I've stressed price to all of them. Two of my listings are with an investor and he's pretty firm on it. Then the other one, they keep saying, we'll wait another week. We'll wait another week because we keep getting showings. But um I think that's that's a good way to script to them the the triangle you were just saying. So I might try that. Very universal. Yeah, yeah. the triangle. Um, and then I know you brought up time blocking. We did host another class about time blocking uh, probably about a year ago. Um, something that uh, obviously controlling your schedule and having a life by design is something I'm passionate about and if that's something that you'd like to, uh, you know, me and coach more around, I'd be happy for any of you to do that. Christian, I just wanted to touch on what you were talking about with the listings and the pricing. Um, you know, uh, the conversation that I usually have up front with potential listers is, um, when you go in with comps and they are very unrealistic about what they think their house is worth, obviously the first question I ask is, what do you think your house is worth? That's that's the question I go in with. And then I circle back around and say, well, this is what the comps reflects. And you know, a lot, a lot of people are just very unrealistic because it's their home. They have attachments and you have to, you know, make them understand that when it goes on the market, it's not their home, it's now a house. And now it's you know, you have to put it in, in, in a way where people are going to see it with their things in it, you know, and making it their home. And so the conversation I had, and I actually spoke with another agent that I um, been working with on getting a house under contract, and she had made a very good point. Um, we were talking about just unrealistic expectations of sellers. And, um, you know, like the the one that I went and did, she wanted to sell the house for like 50,000 more than what the comps reflected. And I'm like, okay, well, I can, I can certainly list your house at whatever, if you wanted to list it for a million, you know, I'm the employee, you're my employer. I can certainly do that. However, you know, it's going to come to be, if you really want your house sold and you want that sold in a reasonable amount of time, what we're going to have to do is this, you know, 
a price adjustment after seven days. And I think Mark and I had a conversation about that. If you're not getting, you know, any showings or any offers, then it's time to do a price adjustment after seven days. And this agent brought up a very good point. And she puts it in her contract that it's if, if after seven days, the house is not moving, there's no traction whatsoever, then there's going to be a price adjustment down in increments of whatever. And, you know, my one gal who was, you know, wanting to sell it for 50000 over what it's, you know, what it's worth, I said, the adjustment that needs to take place is going to have to be a substantial amount, you know, not like $500, a couple thousand. I told her $10,000 and she was agreeable to that. Same thing that was said by the agent when we had this discussion. And she said, I just wrote it into the listing agreement that if it doesn't, you know, get that traction, if it doesn't get any offers, then it's time to do a price adjustment after seven days. So that way there's no him and hawing going back. I don't know. I can't make a decision. No, we had this conversation up front and this is what really needs to take place in order for your house to sell and sell in a reasonable amount of time and not sit on the market for one, two, three months. Because the house that I was supposed to be listing, it went to somebody else. It's a long story, but it was better that I not take this listing because of situation involved. Um, it's been on the market still for three months and they haven't done a price adjustment on it in two and a half months. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely happens. I mean, I'll tell you a, a short story that's funny. This is not supposed to be something that you learn from, but the 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 year that for sale by owners really took off with me. Um, you know the number one reason for sale by owners don't sell on their own? They don't want to pay a commission. No. And it's not because they don't have an agent either. It's because they overprice their house. I took so many listings for sale by owners and the listing, I mean, the, the house was for sale by owner, $15,000 or it's overpriced. So I take the listing and it's $15,000 overpriced and I already go, okay, set a reminder on my phone in two weeks to have the pricing conversation. I knew it before I even met with them. Now, I'm not saying that's right. <sighs> Something that I've learned since then is that there's these price, there's these temperature checks that you need to strategically set up with each one of your clients, especially if you think the house is overpriced where you have a conversation with the seller and you show them that their expectations are not being met right away by the market. I'll go on a listing appointment and I'll say, Mr. Seller, if we price it properly, then you're going to have showings all day long. You're going to have, you know, numerous showings every day. The second we the house hits the market, we're going to have five, 10, 15 showings. Now, if you don't, that could say something, just saying. Um, and then it's also like, look, the day I sign the listing agreement, it goes live tomorrow. I'm telling all my buyer clients about it. These are examples, by the way. I'm telling all my buyer clients who are interested in that area about it. Now, if none of them are interested, I'm going to call my seller and say, Mr. Seller, you know, we did a VIP window where we told some of our clients about your listing and how it was hitting the market. And none of them were interested. Now, this is somewhat, uh, this is a conversation that we should have because uh, one of three things can happen. My buyers are highly motivated. They're pre-qualified and they weren't interested. So we can do three things moving forward before the house hits the market. We can, one, pray that somebody comes along and buys it. Mm -hmm. Two, we can clean up the house and do some updates, which I know you said you wanted to sell it on, sell it as is. So uh, we could also do a price reduction. Um, which one would you like to do? You know, do you want to pray or do a price reduction? Nobody wants to pray. <laughs> Not in that way, but nobody wants to pray their house sells. Like nobody wants to leave it to the man upstairs. You want it to be sold before you even list it. Um, so I have those pricing temperature checks with them. I have another one two days after it's on the market. And I'll be like, look, I said 5, 10, 15 people are supposed to be coming through. We only got one or two, you know? Um, and then I have another one a weekend, but then it's also uh, just to be totally out of order and non-professional. If you look back at the beginning of the listing, when I'm on the appointment, I'm showing them a piece of paper that says, 
if your house is on the market seven days, here's the list price to sale price, 14 days list price to sale price, 30 days list price to sale price, 60 days list price to sale price. You can pull that data from the MLS and you can see a clear downward trajectory of the amount of money that a seller nets. And it comes out to be that like nine and a half percent lower sale price than list price after 30 days, whereas the first week on market is 100%. So we could lose nine and a half percent of your profits because you want to price the house a little bit higher in the first 30 days. And it's just showing them that. And then asking, what do you want to price it at? You know? Um, so, yeah. Cool. Can you talk for a minute, Christian? And I know that this can be a separate class and have it a separate class, but... Give us the two minute version of how you think about your time, the time blocking, how you track it, how you mm -hmm. hold yourself accountable to maximizing your efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I did time. Let me think. I'm thinking particularly your physical tracker. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, my philosophy has changed on time blocking, and I don't know if it's because I have. Uh, internalized it um, or if it's just because I'm lazy I don't think that's why but I have a time block I do it every time I come into the office but I don't need it anymore I have my important events on the calendar and I know what stuff I need to get done every day it's a very short list my 20% is very short um, so for me I've done so much coaching around this stuff where I have my appointments on my calendar and I don't want to be restricted to 30, 15 or 15 minute to 30 minute increments uh, for, for the entire day. But I did do that for three years and it did help me. Um, I was able to accomplish way more than I ever thought I could in a year. Um, but that's what it looks like. Um, I went on Google Sheets and I made a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet is 15 minute increments for from 6 a.m. to you know 6 p.m. And uh I just printed out the spreadsheet and I'd fill in the little boxes for those time periods and I'd fill up the whole sheet and um that's my day, you know. Um so I think as long as you know what your actual uh I think if you know what your actual um, 20% is uh, and you know when you're going to do it and you know how you're going to do it and you feel confident in that, um, then the, all, all the rest can fall into place. You guys, Sam, are you familiar with the Big Rocks exercise? No, I'm not. Well, basically, it's a basically just a very short version Big Rocks exercise says that if you have a glass jar that's empty and you want to fill it up, are you going to start with sand first, pouring sand into it, um, and then gravel, and then rocks, and then boulders? Or are you going to start with the boulders first, and then the rocks, and then the gravel, and then the sand? You want to start with the big stuff first because all the small things will fill in around it. But if you start with sand first, you'll never be able to fill up the jar. So it's just saying that you want to figure out what your big rocks are, which is your 20%. What are you going to do to take more listings? What are you going to do to close more leads? And then you let everything else fill out, fill up your time around that. Um so essentially like doing what would be my hard thing that I always want to put off to the side first mm -hmm. that will of course generate leads and stuff like that. Yeah. It is like swallowing a pill, like, except it's not a pill. It's a frog. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's, there's not an expression of like in real estate for calling leads of like, you know, swallow your medicine. It's swallow the frog. Um, it's like swallowing a frog. It's not like taking a pill. Uh, I have no problem taking pills. I can take them without water, but a frog, like that's something where, you know, you gotta 
<laughs> you really got to work for it, you know? So yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no pill. There's a frog. Sorry to tell you guys. We have five more minutes. Any other questions before we end it? Can you just touch a little bit on database? Mm -hmm. Lillian wants asking me to touch on database. Um, in regards to follow up, um, organization, um, follow up. Follow up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that follow, I think I can kind of relate it back to the big rocks exercise um, where you've got your big things, then you fill in the small things to follow it. And um, it's all important. Uh, I'm not saying that the big rocks are the only thing you have to do, but the big rocks in a database follow up type environment are going to be your uh, calls, four calls a year. If you're in bold, they call it DTD2, do the database two, and it's literally just calling your entire sphere uh, four times every year. Um, there are some agents who only call once a year. I don't think there's any real wrong way to do it. I think you really could benefit the most off of doing four. And then you've got everything else that fills in. Now, the 33 touch plan that I brought up earlier is just 33 touches. Four of them would be your phone calls. And then you've got direct mail. So I send out a postcard every year. Some people do a postcard every quarter. That's fine too. But that's 12 touches for me in a postcard. And then I send a monthly newsletter out. That's another 12 touches. And then I post on Facebook at least once a week. So that's another like, that's a crazy amount of touches for my Facebook people. Um, then I've got events. I have four events every year. Each time I host an event, I uh, send out a reminder. Um, I send out a text message. Um, I send out a recap. It's usually when I do my DTD2 calls. I'm just saying, hey, I have an event. Oh, by the way, do you know anybody looking to buy or sell a home? You know, um, so the MREA actually has a really good graphic, I believe, Mark, uh, just in regards to database and the 33 touch plan. Thank you. My pleasure. So real quick, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, what kind of like lead gen, like do you have whenever you were first starting, did you do like Opsity or um like I know that there's some other ones out there? Is there anything like specific that worked for you and that you found like was worth it, I guess? Um yeah, uh mm -hmm. This is going to get a little shameless. I might plug my team and how we're looking for agents at the end of it only because I think it plays into it. But my first listing I ever took, like I said, was for sale by owner. Um, it was a for sale by owner. Um, so that's how I got my first listing. My first sale I ever got was from an open house. Um, my mentor let me host his open houses. And uh, I got my first listing that way. Cash buyer. Um for a house right down the street from here but um that's the answer to your question um i did host open houses like crazy my first couple years i did an hour open house and the way my mentor held his business all his listings were in lewisville ohio so i would do listings from I would do an open house from 12 to one, from one to two, from two to three, and they'd all be five, 10 minutes apart. So I'd have to leave five minutes early and get to the one five minutes late. And there'd always be a line of people waiting for me. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this agent late? But I got five open houses done in a day and I closed a lot of sales that way. Um, so, uh, you know, it's funny because we're getting, we're, we're, 
uh, we're getting back into open houses and we have a really big system we're building so that we can have another uh, huge source of business from open houses. But yeah. Hey, we're at the time for domination. Cool. Thanks, Christian. Awesome. Thank Thanks, guys. You. Stopping any time we're here. But anyway, yeah, like I said, we're uh, trying to do more open houses. I and mean, if anybody's looking for some, um, or a mentor, message me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya.